Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Modern Bar Cart Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick, and today we're going to return to the long form interview format with a discussion about cocktails and food. Two things I love dearly and two things that are really important when you are thinking about throwing a cocktail party, small or large. But first, two quick announcements. Numero one, Valentine's Day 2018 is literally next week, people, and you officially need to come up with something creative post-haste. Luckily, Modern Bar Cart has your back. Yeah, you can thank us later. We teamed up with our friends over at Chaco Tenango to bring you the Bittersweet Box, which holds two 30-milliliter bottles of our amazing embitterment bitters, orange and chocolate, as well as two premium dark chocolate bar minis. And those flavors are Seabreeze, which is a salted 64% dark chocolate, and Cacao, which is the same percentage, 64%, but seeded with amazing crunchy cacao nibs. Now, we've done events with Chocolate Tenango in the past, and when I watch people taste their chocolate, it's one of those really personal kind of religious experiences where their eyes roll back in their head and they emit this primal moan, just going, it's really sexual, but it's one of the best ways to describe how this chocolate is just a little different from the stuff you normally come across. So, if you're looking to elicit a moan or two from your sweetheart this Valentine's Day, maybe not the kind I just made, go ahead and visit modernbarcart.com and order your bittersweet box for just $14.99 plus shipping, which is roughly the price of a decent bottle of wine. But remember, Valentine's Day is coming up fast, so if you want to make sure you have your gift on time, please get us your order ASAP. We do aim to please, but we are subject to the slings and arrows of outrageous mail carriers just like everyone else. And this brings me to announcement number dose. Free shipping on orders over $40. That's it. It's as simple as that. We've been getting really amazing feedback from folks about the quality of our products, but unfortunately we live in the age of Amazon. And the way I think about Amazon is kind of like that teacher's pet who always works way too hard on the class project and then volunteers to present first, thereby setting a completely unreasonable standard for the rest of us. But on the other hand, free shipping is awesome. So what we did is we looked at what your average order size was and we tried to figure out if the numbers made sense to give you free shipping at that price point. And lo and behold, it all worked out. Now, keep in mind, my degrees are in psychology and poetry, so I may very well be putting our company out of business with some sort of drop decimal point or something here, but who cares? You got your free shipping. Everybody is happy. We'll be putting up a banner on the site and announcing this over social media very soon, but I wanted to let our podcast listeners know first, because thanks to your feedback, we made this change. So everyone out there should be applauding you folks who are listening to this podcast for your feedback that got us free shipping on orders over $40. And that, in my opinion, deserves a toast, which means it's time for you to make yourself a drink. Today's featured cocktail is inspired by the lightning round in this episode, and it is the Upside Down Martini. Now, some of you might be tempted to think that an upside down martini is about the saddest thing you'll ever see at a cocktail party, but it's a trick. The name refers not to the glass and the liquid contents, which would be tragic if spilled, but rather to the ratio of gin to dry vermouth. It's upside down. It's flipped on its head. There are a bunch of different recipes for the upside down martini floating around on the internet, so I'm going to give you two to choose from that I feel are actually palatable and The key here, as always, is to use dry vermouth that is either fresh or that has been properly refrigerated after opening. Otherwise, it's going to taste kind of funky and ruin the cocktail. 
So the first variation is what I'll call the orthodox upside down martini. And this involves two ounces of dry vermouth. I really like Dolan here. Uh, martini makes some good stuff. And then Via, V-Y-A out of California is also really cool. So two ounces of a nice dry vermouth, one ounce of gin, and then several dashes of orange bitters. Just because the martini's upside down doesn't mean the bitters fall out here, folks. Bitters are crucial. Now, let's say you don't quite want the vermouth to take over completely here. Let's say you want to kind of flip your martini upside down, but maybe more on its side than upside down. For that, you could sub in the following perfect ratio of main ingredients, ounce and a half of dry vermouth, ounce and a half of gin, and then still your several dashes of orange bitters to round out the drink. There's always room in a simple cocktail like the martini to make it your own, whether that's by modulating the garnish, you know, subbing out your orange garnish for maybe a lemon twist or the spirits ratio like we did here, or even the bitters by subbing out your orange bitters for something like lavender or aromatic if you've got like a darker gin. And that's what I'd encourage you to do. The upside down martini is kind of like looking at the world upside down. It's the same stuff. It's just organized differently. And that is where the fun lies. So now that you've got your drink, I am pleased to announce this episode's guest, Kathleen Tozy of the Fancy Schmancy Co., which is a food company that currently produces a line of curious crackers that really bring your party to life. Some of the things we discuss in this episode include how the relationship between cocktails and food is different than your typical food and wine pairing, a crash course in assembling charcuterie plates and other cocktail-friendly snacks, the anatomy of the quote-unquote perfect bite, best practices for planning the food at your next cocktail party or soiree, fantasies that include getting drunk with Julia Child, and much, much more. Kathleen's a friend of mine, and she and I really jive on matters of design, packaging, and what it means to make someone's day with a handcrafted flavor experience. If she asked, I would follow her blindly into the darkest, most perilous of adventures as long as she promised to make me a cheese plate with smoked dragon meat when all the monsters are vanquished. So without further hyperbole or absurdity, I hope you enjoy this interview with Kathleen Tozy of the Fancy Schmancy Co. Kathleen, thanks for being on the show. Hi, thanks for having me. So today we are focusing on food to serve with cocktails. So it's kind of a pairing episode, but also kind of a general discussion of, hey, you're hosting a po cocktail party. How are you going to feed your guests? And uh, our guest today is Kathleen Tozy of the Fancy Schmancy Co. Could you just introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hi, I'm Kathleen. Um, I'm the founder of the Fancy Schmancy Co. We make creative accompaniments for entertaining in every day. Um, and our first products are a really fun line of crackers that we have five different flavors and they are perfect for cheese and cocktail parties. Um, and I have a big food background. I've worked in food my whole life. I started in my family's restaurant when I was a kid, went to culinary school. Um, a lot of my career was spent in retail at Whole Foods Market and I love to help people throw parties. So <laughs> Nice. Um, so can you just describe what you're doing now, kind of what you're making and what led you on that journey, so to speak? Yeah. So about uh, a little over a year ago, I was doing a lot of different entrepreneurial things, one of which was selling cheese for an awesome cheese maker, Charleston Artisan Cheese House in South Carolina. And I had made um, a beautiful cheese board for Thanksgiving that included making my own crackers and these great star shapes. And they just became a hit. And I decided that I really wanted to pursue that and kind of just figure out like what else I could do to create um, accompaniments for all these cheeses that I'm a big cheese nerd, have a, a background in selling and I like to make cheese at home. So um, yeah, so I just got into that and within six months I had product on the shelf. And so I have five different flavors. We have butter oat, onion rye, ginger beet, curry carrot and cocoa spice uh, and they're all in uh, fun shapes and really cute packaging yeah, yeah your packaging is beautiful <laughs> it's uh can you describe it to people oh well 
the standout is that it's hexagon shaped. <laughs> so, so that was cool to build a hexagon box. Um, but also just each flavor has a bright color and a drawing of the cracker shape on the front. And we tend to be kind of whimsical and fun for sure. So what do you like about this now? You said you came from kind of like a Whole Foods market situation where you were maybe not interacting with people, but you were certainly everything you were doing was for shoppers at, in the end. And now you are kind of an entrepreneur. So what do you like about it and what are some of the challenges? Yeah. So I love to be creative. I love to make things that are interesting and quality. Um, I use organic ingredients and really good quality ingredients. Um, so I love the process of creating and finding products that I think people could use to make what they do at home a little bit, a little bit fancier in an easy way. I like to make things approachable and fancy, but actually unpretentious. <laughs> thus, thus the schmancy, thus right? Thus the schmancy. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that's probably what I love the most, the creative aspect of it. And then just like creativity isn't just about product. It's about like how you're selling it and the packaging and how you're getting your, um, your message out to customers. So the, all of those aspects, even sometimes how you figure out how to make the money stretch is creative in, in the startup world. So that's definitely what I love about it. The challenges, I think the biggest challenge is just fig, like it's me on my own. So balancing all the things and figuring out what to prioritize to like move forward is probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, it's always tricky when you're involved in the creative aspect of it and you kind of come up for air and, and then there's like a bunch of bills looking at you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah, that. So listeners, Kathleen and I met through Union Kitchen, which is the food accelerator that we are both members of here in Washington, D.C. So we're frequently operating in the same space, using the same office, printing things on the same printer. And so we got together and we said, wouldn't it be awesome to just have a discussion about food and cocktails? Because we, we on the Modern Bar Cart podcast, talk a lot about technique. We talk about kind of like the theory of why things, why different flavors work together, but we don't ever really talk about food that much. And food is almost always there with cocktails in a cocktail setting, whether that's at a party or because you're getting cocktails at a bar. Um, so I think it, it's worth our time, especially as we think about hospitality and how to throw a good cocktail party to talk about the relationship between food and cocktails and how we can kind of optimize our cocktail food game. And maybe if there's some awesome like tips and tricks that we can learn along the way. So I guess my first question is how do we think about food and cocktails? Um, and mainly my question is like, there's always these discussions of like pairing wine with food, but rarely do you see that same thing discussed with cocktails. So if, if there's a difference, I'm curious what that is. And then I guess more broadly, just what's the relationship? How do we think about this? Yeah. I think there is a little bit of a difference. I think um, when you talk about pairing food and wine, it's very much about um, the meal, like the sit down experience for the most part. And I think that's how you should approach your wine pairing with food. Like it's kind of, um, it's, it's the same as like creating a sauce for the entree. It's the wine should sort of like be um, part of the whole menu, right? And some of that still applies to cocktails, but I think with cocktails, you don't as often, not to say that you can't, but you don't as often have your cocktail with like the full sit down meal. And so I think you're more thinking about pairing it with things you snack on, things like to nosh, right? When you think of a cocktail party, it's not like a sit down, like dinner with that's plated or even, you know, a, a big buffet, right? It's much more about like the small plates, the small bites, um, and the snack type approach, appetizer type thing. So I think it's a little bit, um, I don't want to say easier. It's just a little bit different. The relationship to me is is still similar in, um, so the, the best, the most common f food and wine pairing is like what grows together goes together. So the wine of a region and the food of the region, like more often than not will go together. And I think you can still use some of those like classic ideas to pair cocktails with food. Um, but the food is the difference. Like the food is, you know, a different sort of style of food when you're having a cocktail party. So like, 
If you're thinking about a tequila or mezcal based cocktail, go to Mexico and make mini tacos or, um, you know, some amazing queso dip or like things that sort of are within that region. And that's like one easy sort of go to. Yeah, I think uh, one thing that jumps to mind for me would be like bourbon and you know soul food mm-hmm. type things. Totally. Uh, what biscuits. else? What else can we do? Yeah, biscuits, gravy. <laughs> oh my god. Same thing with like rum cocktails. You kind of go into that like more sort of tropical, fresh, like summery. Not always, but you definitely like the weight of um, a spirit can also like go with like the weight of the food, right? So I tend to lean towards gin in the summer. Um, so it's going to like kind of those like lighter, fresher, summery, more flavors. Um, often that works well too. Yeah, for sure. And as you were, as you were talking, a couple of things came to mind. One is, and this is something that I hadn't thought about as we were going into the episode, but it totally makes sense is that you don't tend to see people drinking cocktails during dinner. Yeah. Um, not that it couldn't happen. Not to say that I've never done it before, (laughs) uh, but I'm remembering back to my uh, interview with Jonathan Fasano from Don Ciccio e Fili, who they are makers of Amari here in DC, and the concept of the aperitivo and the digestivo kind of were circling around in my head as you mentioned that, because when it comes to a meal, you're right, it's the, the more often than not there's wine, wine is lower ABV than a cocktail, it's easier to drink more of um, as you're chewing larger mouthfuls of food. And so in a large meal setting, it seems like the cocktails tend to be bookends. You get your aperitivo to stimulate the appetite, and then you have your digestivo to kind of stimulate your digestion and perhaps, you know, segue into the dessert course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also think that like a cocktail can get lost with like a heavy meal. Yeah. You know, the nuance of a cocktail where wine is meant to do that, meant to pair, meant to flow with it. Right. Interesting. Interesting. So are there any foods out there that pair particularly well with certain cocktails or that you particularly enjoy breaking out when you're doing the entertaining? Um, so a couple of things come to mind. Like one, we keep talking about like small things, which is really easy if you're throwing a cocktail party. It makes it a little bit easier, right? So a lot of things that can be prepared ahead. I'm again, a big cheese fan. So always having like a beautiful cheese and or charcuterie board um, is kind of an easy very interactive way to like have food um <clears throat> at a cocktail party and often like pairs really well so cheese it, same kind of weight sort of concept so if you're in like summer and you're having gin cocktails or like fresh things um cheeses that are lighter like the goat smoke sheep's milk um fresher type things really nice and then you know the flip side of that like if you're you know in bourbon um whiskey sort of territory you know, those more aged cheeses like Gruyere's and aged Gouda's, things like that are really nice. And and, and the charcuterie, like, you know, beautiful aged like ham, like things like that with bourbon. So good. So I think always having, if you're, you know, if you're into that, always having that like cheese and charcuterie board, and that can include so many things, including vegetables and fruit and pickles and all kinds of like things that you can snack on is really key because it's easy and you can do it well ahead of time. And then just picking like a couple things that are maybe a little bit more complicated, but still have some do ahead aspect to them. um, So that when people get to the house, you can like just heat it up and it's ready to go. Um, Anything on skewers always is great. Tiny sandwiches, uh, like mini tacos, things like that. Nice. So I love charcuterie as well. Uh, What are the ingredients or charcuterie board hacks that you employ when you are putting together one of these for uh, a get together yeah so first of all you need like the cheese and or meats right so that's sort of the basic usually three to five if you're doing cheese and meat then i would say maybe like three or so of each if you're just doing cheese three to five cheeses um, and a variety of different textures and types of milk so you know, if you don't like blue, maybe not blue, but most people love it. Uh, so the, a goat cheese, something soft, like a brie, something more aged, um, just like a variety of different things. If you don't like something, don't put it on there. Um, <laughs> and then, um, so a variety of those types of things. 
you need a vessel, right? So that's where my crackers come in. <laughs> <laughs> Um, or whatever you choose, <laughs> um, but that's uh, that's what I make. And then I like to say like some uh, accompaniments that are either like jam or mustard. So if you're going more savory mount, a route, the mustards can be really nice if you want something a little a little bit on the sweet side, um, like berries, mar- bar- berry jam, marmalade, things like that. Nuts are always nice, candy nuts, salty nuts. Um, it's like a good um, contrast. And then um, some fresh fruits. Yes. And if you wanted to go uh, savory, you can definitely do like pickled vegetables um, as opposed to fruit. Like if you really want to go hard savory. Right. You can also do dried fruit depending mm-hmm. on, you know, what the season is. Uh, like a nice dried apricot. Totally. These are the things that you can kind of fine tune, folks. So, you, so you're, you're hearing like all these different options and I'm just imagining like... As Kathleen is describing this, I'm imagining how this plate's going to look. I'm I'm imagining like, all right, I'm at the store. I'm buying all these different cheeses. Some of them come in squares, and it's going to be more logical to cut those into squares or rectangles. But some of them are going to come in wheels, so I might have the opportunity to cut those into more triangular-shaped pieces to kind of give a little bit of variety on that. Uh, Because one of the other beautiful things about a charcuterie board is that if you take a little bit of time to set it up and prep it really well, it's just a beautiful thing for people to see as they come in. And if you're smart in the way you set it up with the spreads and everything, even as people take little pieces out of it, it's not going to just look completely destroyed as, so, as soon as somebody like starts to partake in it. So any, any like aesthetic things of setting up a charcuterie board? Yeah. Um, well, I think first of all, like don't overthink it, like find the things that you like in a variety of textures and flavors, um, is like most important. And then, um, I like to make things kind of spill and cascade. So I do always recommend that you at least cut a little piece out of the cheese, even if it's the kind of like rat wheel of spready cheese. Cause if you don't cut into it, people will think they can't. Um, so always cutting a little bit. I like to leave a little bit, even if it's like a big square, like I like to leave a little bit of the big square so you can see the actual like hunk of cheese, but you don't necessarily have to. And then just kind of arrange them so that like all of the things are together and, uh, just whatever looks pretty to you. Yeah. (laughs) Some other things to take into account would be like if you're using jams or pickled vegetables or mustard and spreads, is that going to be something that you maybe want to make available on another small plate or ramekin near it? It all depends on what your setup looks like, but I think uh, like probably the most important thing would be to get some sort of large plate or platter for the main thing. And then, you know, it's also good if you're throwing a larger party to be able to break out of that plate and then kind of put the extras around it in a constellation that makes sense. And my one recommendation is that you do put a little bit of thought into the way that people are going to be flowing through the space and actually interacting with like the charcuterie board, for example. I know this is a very specific example of food and cocktails, but let's stick with it for a second because I have a really big pet peeve when it comes to food ergonomics and it's the taco bar. If you've ever had a taco bar where the cheese is not directly after the meat, that is the wrong taco bar because the (laughs) cheese is supposed to melt on the meat and any other way you do it is idiotic. And I know it's a small thing, but if you can just take a second and say, oh, well, people will probably fill up their plate and then they'll aim for the spread. So if you put the spreads after whatever that means logically for your space after the the board then somebody can be putting the spread on there while somebody else is filling up their plate and it's just not like a massive disaster in terms of people traffic right so i know it sounds silly but those are the little things that i care about um what are your favorite things to serve any any memorable foods that you've seen served at cocktail parties um i really like things on skewers at cocktail parties I think that's fun, Um, and also it keeps your fingers clean, um, which is really important if you're standing. So that's the other thing that I think is important, like just as much as like flow, how you flow through the food and the buffet, or if it's on a buffet versus on like multiple cocktail tables, is making sure that you have food that you can eat standing up, um, or like not necessarily sitting at a table, right? You might be sitting, but it might be like in a random chair, you know, without a table, that sort of thing. So making sure that the food is kind of easier to eat 
um, on a tiny plate standing and things like that. So things on skewers, like if you do, if you want to do like a little uh, sandwich thing, like say you're having like some cool bourbon cocktail and you want like a little biscuit <laughs> with like some jam or some ham in there, mm. I, like make it little, like don't make it a full size thing. Right. Um, so that it's, it's just easy to eat standing up. I think that's pretty key with a cocktail party. Right. And, uh, make napkins available. That's, <laughs> I doesn't sound like I, I don't I don't know I I don't have napkins when I eat at my house I don't <laughs> I don't true. know I just don't make a mess I I don't know but th- these are things to think about and especially the fact that you know if they're holding the plate in one hand and potentially the cocktail in the other they're either going to need somewhere to set the cocktail or somewhere to set the plate uh, so having uh, furniture arrangements mm-hmm. where people can actually set things down and actually maybe giving them a little signal that they should be setting things down there like by putting, you know, like a, a candle on a table or something, making it look like coasters. A, coasters, exactly. <laughs> yeah. These are all good recommendations. Yeah. So awesome. skewers, other good things about skewers that I like are you can go the vegetable route more creatively than a salad or a dish that you would have to eat with a fork. Yes, definitely. Sometimes vegetarian cocktail food can be a little, you know, can be a little tricky, but if you put like fun, like veggies and, um, even if you do, if you like tofu or those types of, um, things on a skewer, it's just as beautiful as like whatever shrimp or chicken you put on there. Right. Cool. So those are some great recommendations. I wanted to talk about something in particular that came up in a conversation that you and I had a while back. And this kind of relates to your cheese background and the crackers. It relates to the whole shebang because it really is just the whole universe in a jar almost. It's this thing called the perfect bite. And I was intrigued by it. So I'm hoping you can talk about the perfect bite, what it is, and just the whole context of it. Yeah. So the perfect bite is some a, a word that specifically cheesemongers say, but I think a lot of people in the food industry, of the like the literal bite that has all of the things that make the perfect balance of flavors all in one bite. So it's actually a piece of the competition for cheesemongers at this um, competitive. It's called the Cheesemonger Invitational. It's a competitive like. <laughs> thing that cheesemongers do it's a real thing and you make it up it sounds like a golf tournament <laughs> <laughs> they do it twice a year and they compete for like to be like the best cheesemonger in the nation there's all kinds of like pieces of this competition uh, including how you weigh and wrap cheese to this thing called the perfect bite and <clears throat> it's so it's a vessel the cheese and then an accompaniment or two and definitely i would say like rarely more than four ingredients total and i love the idea it is actually the concept in general is why I made my crackers bite size. There, uh, you often see like big giant crackers, and that was definitely like a thing that was very popular for a while. But I love the idea of the cracker being like the size that you want to bite. And so my crackers are also fun shapes, so they make for a really cute, perfect bite. And they can be used like literally as like hors d'oeuvres, like you could like line them up that way. What kind of shapes? Um, so I have stars. I have hearts, I have uh, flowers, and then circles and squares. <laughs> cool. Good deal. Good variety. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's and th- so when you're thinking about making that perfect bite, it's it's usually in reference to cheese. It doesn't have to be, but there's so the cheese is always going to have like a certain element of fattiness to it. So you want to balance that out with something um, like sweet or acidic, and then. And sometimes even like if the cheese is salty, you can balance that out with the sweet. So some examples of the perfect bite could be like onion rye cracker, Gruyere cheese, um, mustard, maybe a little bit of like shaved ham on there. Yeah. Um, another one could be um, my, I have a cocoa spice cracker. So that with like a really rich triple cream brie and like a, a berry compote. Mm. Um I've used the butter oat crackers with um, a feta, so like saltiness to it, with like watermelon and mint, like very summery, oh, yeah. fresh. Yeah. Very nice. <clears throat> so it's just about balancing out the flavors. Um, and it's kind of what you want to do with food in a larger 
um, like in the big picture anyway, like you want a beautiful balance of flavor. Your, your food has to have enough salt and enough acid and enough fattiness to it. Um, and so it's really just about condensing that down into like one little bite. Yeah. I think that's what appeals to me. It's just the, like how rich and condensed the thing is. And the other thing that attracted me to the perfect bite was that it struck me as the same set of considerations that one takes into account when making a good cocktail. Yes, totally. So, right. So you've got, you know, you're talking about sweet and acidic and fatty. We don't get fatty too often in cocktails, right. although occasionally, yeah. you know, if you're using, we, you know, <laughs> if, if you want to listen to some discussion about that, check out the egg cocktail episode we did uh, a couple months ago. Um, but so less fatty, but I guess more bitter as mm-hmm. right? so you get more bitter in the cocktails than you would in the perfect bite. Um, but it's the same set of considerations. And one of the things that I always um, kind of entreat listeners to do is to think about when you're designing a cocktail, like think about how you can get things that are pulling in opposite directions, right? So you're talking about how like the sweet can pull in the opposite direction of the salty or the fatty, uh, how the like almost like the fresher acidic can pull in the opposite direction in a completely different direction from both of those two. Um, and I think it's that sort of tension that's created that makes it a really cool experience. Um, and that one that you can kind of be enhanced by texture in the case of the perfect bite, which mm-hmm. is really interesting. Does yeah. texture play into that? Absolutely. So, um, like the crunch of the vessel, usually the vessel, like the vessel, no matter what it is, whether it's my crackers or not, is something that has some crunch to it. Um, the cheese <clears throat> has softness to it generally, but there's also like hard cheeses. Um, and then like a lot of times I'll put like a candy nut with the, some of those things for even more texture. Um, I think it definitely plays into it. Right. Yeah. And I like almost, you know, I like, uh, pickled vegetables. I've just been thinking about pickled vegetables like the whole time we've been talking because it's something that, you know, it's, it's year round. It's a really great go-to and it's a really, you can use it in such small amounts, whether that's on a charcuterie board or Mm -hmm. in the perfect bite or something like that on an hors d'oeuvre that you're actually serving. And it can really add that really nice pop of brightness in the same way that using a shrub or using really nice, uh, fresh squeezed citrus juice can add to a cocktail. So I think pickled vegetables are a really nice uh, thing to keep in mind as you're building your kind of repertoire for cocktail bites. Um, And also think about how that's going to pair with the cocktail. Because if I'm drinking an old fashioned, I don't necessarily want to take a big bite out of a giant dill pickle. Right. That sounds fairly <laughs> vile, but if we got martinis, yeah. then I'm thinking that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got a few good recommendations on how to think about food and cocktails and the relationship between them, a few different little little hacks to help make charcuterie boards and maybe some past hors d'oeuvres that are like the perfect bite. Um, what about for our listeners who've been thinking about throwing a cocktail party? And there, I have two very specific people in mind here, two different types of people. There's the person who's kind of like in their mid twenties, maybe just kind of moving into cocktails and they're, this is their first time with cocktails and really probably their first time hosting anything of scale. And then the other type of person that I'm thinking about is somebody who's maybe a little bit older who has, you know, enjoyed drinking beer or wine in the past and has just kind of gotten into cocktails as like a a hobby or pastime. And they've thrown parties before, but maybe they haven't thrown cocktails into the mix as much. So those are kind of like the two types of people I'm thinking about. Do you have any recommendations uh, of how to effectively go about throwing a party with cocktails and food? I think um, a couple things came to mind. Um, First of all, especially if you want your party to be cocktail centric, which is really fun and cool thing to do, your guests would really dig that. So I think the fun part of that is sort of honing in on what cocktails you want to serve um, and not making it like I have to be the full bartender, but like we're going to have a Sazerac party. Right. Or whatever. Um, and it could be, you know, a, a spirit, like it could be a, just tequila or it could be like, um, you know, a, like two specific cocktails. Um, 
or one even. And I think that's probably one thing that is um, makes it a little less intimidating is to kind of like pick the cocktail and like start from that place and then work your way out into the food. Um, especially if you really want to explore and play around with and like have your friends enjoy that particular cocktail, like make that the star of the show. Um, and I feel like that's, uh, like that's a great place to start. Um, <clears throat> so starting from, if you start from there and I feel like that goes for like either one of those two groups of people, um, like start with the cocktail and then work your way out from there. So if you are used to hosting, um, then you can maybe have a little bit more complicated of a menu or you're comfortable with the timing of things, which is always the, the hardest part to learn when you're throwing a party is timing with food anyway. So I think that like if you're a little bit more experienced, maybe you can make your menu a little bit more complicated, but start from that cocktail and work your way out. So if you want to do the tequila based cocktails, like think about the, the mini tacos or the um, queso dip and all of those sort of fun things. Um, if you wanted to do like just the summertime and you want to do like gin and like just fresh vegetables, very farmer's markety, like start from that place and figure out your food. But I think if you're, if you're new to it, like, don't be afraid to keep it simple. Um, make it fun, make it simple. Like just have like enough food. Right. And heat, right. Heat is like a big complexifier. I feel like if you you need something that needs to be either prepped hot or served hot, I feel like it just gets a hundred times harder. Yeah, absolutely. So I, so starting from that place of like what kind of food you want to serve, then kind of think about like foods that you can create ahead of time in your planning process. So that's where things like the charcuterie board come into play. Cause you can make, you can make that a day ahead. Just don't put things that need to remain crisp, like, uh, or that will leak on the platter, right? You can set up the cheese and meat and like wrap in plastic wrap or your, if you do like a, a veggie tray or a fruit tray or something like that. So as much as you can do ahead of time, like the better off you're going to be and the more fun you're going to have like in the moment, which is important. Like you're throwing a party to have fun. So, (laughs) um, so, uh, pick your food with as much you can do ahead as possible. And so things that like things that are on skewers, like that are small tend to cook fast. So that's always another reason to have like little things on skewers. They can be marinating ahead of time. You can just pop them on the grill or in the broiler right before your guests come. I also really like to think about, like you said, things that don't necessarily have to be served hot. Like room temperature stuff is awesome. Right. Um, so that you can have fun in the moment. Um, keep in to like think about also that you have to like make the cocktails so you can't be making the food unless there's two of you and one person's on cocktail duty and one one person's on food duty right so making sure that like if you really want the cocktail to be like the fun part of the party that there's food out for people to like nosh on and then maybe once everybody gets there they've got like something to nosh on and something to drink then you can like pop something else in the oven and pull it out so you have like almost like a second round of food Maybe if you're a little more experienced with the hosting. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that, that may, I, I was, I was thinking the same thing and, and it's almost like you can ahead of time kind of establish a cue for yourself or for yourself and somebody who's helping you. So if you know that there's somebody who's going to be the last person to show up at this party, because there's always that person, just have it be that when that person arrives, that that is the signal to go pop those things in the oven. You've already got them all set up on the, you know, uh, tin foil or on your tray or whatever, and just go and pop them in the oven. I do the same thing to myself. If I need to remember something when I'm falling asleep and I go, Oh shit. Uh, I take the closest thing that's next to me on my dresser and I throw it on the floor where it's not even remotely supposed to be. So that when I wake up in the morning and I say, why the hell is that on the floor? Oh Yeah. I got to do that thing that I thought about right last night, right as I was falling asleep. So it's kind of the same thing. Give yourself that mental trigger. When Lady McLaterson shows up, <laughs> then that's when this goes in the oven. So that's a, there are ways to automate your process, even when you are a kind of a solo act. Uh, but it definitely takes a little bit more prep and thought if you're going to do that. And definitely make yourself a list. 
And if you're really, if you know timing, like you can make a list with time, you know, of like, oh, this is going to take this long, throw this in the oven at this time. And I think that helps a ton. Um, I've been throwing parties since I was a kid with my huge family and I still make a list. I don't necessarily do the timing of it because um, I'm also kind of like, um, well, we'll eat when it's ready sort of hostess. Sure. <laughs> Um, I never make people wait forever, but you know, part of the fun of it is the interacting and the wait and the, you know, the hanging out, right. The like interacting. So, um, but making a list of all the things that need to get done, I still do that every single time. Absolutely. Well, thank you for all your advice on food and pairings. Um, we'll, before we jump off, we'll give people the ways to get in contact with you and they have any questions directly or if they want to figure out how to get their hands on some fancy schmancy uh, curious crackers. Um, but what I want to do now is a quick lightning round. All right, let's do it. Cool. What is your favorite cocktail? Um, French 75. Anything with champagne is amazing. Awesome. <laughs> French 75 is a great drink. <laughs> what is your favorite spirit? What do you like about it? I think gin... Uh, because I like the idea of that it takes this like really clean spirit to start and then it adds in all like the herbal and like interesting flavors. So like trying to pick out those like flavors to me is really neat, but I like that it's like clean and fresh. Yeah. Gin is basically infused vodka and gin is like now it enjoying this like huge renaissance and everyone's like, yeah, screw infused vodka. Uh, unless you make it yourself, then it's not interesting. It, but it's the same as gin. It's just like a That's single true. flavor. That's but no, I agree. Gin is more interesting in general. It just That just kind of crossed my mind. Um, if you could have a cocktail with anyone in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? And what would you talk about? Okay, so definitely Julia Child. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the most amazing hostess ever to exist. Um, <clears throat> so Julia Child, she drank upside down martinis, which is martini with extra vermouth or heavy on the vermouth, right? Yes. So I feel, and I'm not really a martini drinker, but I feel like I would just lean into that spirit <laughs> and drink martinis with Julia Child. Yes. Julia Child making vermouth cool <laughs> before it was even on the map. Yes. She is the original vermouth hipster. Um, so we would be we would be in her French estate. Uh, what's La, La Pichune, I think is how you say it. <laughs> it's it's available to rent on Airbnb now. Oh my god. Um, that's where we would be, and we would be like, we would just we would get drunk and start cooking. So what would happen? <laughs> <laughs> and what do you think you would cook? Uh, but anything that was like in her kitchen. <laughs> yeah, you'd do the drunken drunken uh, yes. refrigerator raid, and... and it would be like the most amazing meal of of my life. I'm sure of it. Yeah, that's an amazing answer. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a great answer. I love that one. Um, are there any books about cocktails, food, home entertaining, perhaps that have been influential or enjoyable for you? Um, I, nothing like huge jumped out into my mind, except I love to have like those sort of basic cocktail books of like how to make everything. Cause I think those are a great base and they're fun to play and learn. Uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. Nothing really jumped to mind. I, when it comes to wine, I'm obsessed with wine folly and I would really like someone to write a cocktail book with that same spirit of infographics. Gotcha. <laughs> So Wine Folly, Wine Folly is a book <laughs> yeah. and it has a bunch of infographics that yes. kind of explain pair everything you need to know about wine in the most simple, like, um, visual way. And I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Like everything from like the color wheel to like how to pair to like where things come from. It's just a really phenomenally well-written book. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we'll, we'll link to that one in the show notes. Another thing that as I was asking the question, I realized that I had a follow up that I wanted to mention when we were talking about um, that idea of starting with a cocktail and then working your way out from there, because the way you described that made me think of a flavor wheel. Because at the center, it's always the very like the way that most color or f rather flavor wheels work is that you begin by identifying like one of very few kind of like this, this is sweet or this is tart or this is, you know, something very basic. And then you kind of, as you work your way out toward the outside of the wheel, the flavors get more 
specific so that by the end you're at you know kind of uh dark uh you know uh dark licorice and red currant and uh barnyard right. <laughs> or something like that but you're starting with oh kind of sweet um and i i like that um approach and it made me think of a couple of different books um one called the flavor bible which is a really good um tool for pairing different flavors so if you're trying to assemble a meal right can you talk about that one have you Um, had any experience with that uh not really but i've i've seen it before but i love the concept of that like i feel like um understanding flavors is really the sort of the key to food and beverage in general so i've got one that i like that has kind of a similar section in it to the flavor bible it's called culinary artistry uh, also really good if you want to think about how to make your beautiful charcuterie board. It's got some good concepts, but it's basically a lot of gathered information. I, I'd call it, if it, I had to retitle it, I'd call it chefs interviewing other chefs. Yeah. Um, Don't they do like the list of like their absolute ingredients in there or something Yes. Like that? So they have their desert island list. Yes, which that's is, what it is. Which is, which is super this fun. This is a really amazing book. It's a great book. But it also has lists of like uh, just generally what you would pair with, let's say... Uh, I'm looking at um, fiddlehead ferns, right? Or let's go figs instead. That's a better one, more accessible. And so they bold the the best things to pair with it. And those are caramel, cream, and honey. But other things in there on that list would be almonds, anise, chocolate, cinnamon, Cointreau. So we've got some uh-huh. cocktail ingredients. Yeah. yeah. Cornmeal, which is interesting, like yeah. Yeah, fried figs. Well, fry and cornmeal. That makes sense. Ooh. Lemon, lavender, ginger. Um, so Beautiful. if you have an ingredient or if you're, if you're looking for something to kind of be the nucleus of your dish, say like, all right, I know that my cocktails are going to be, um, bourbon and I know that my kind of meat or like hearty thing is going to be fried chicken. What goes with fried chicken? You can flip open a book like culinary artistry or a book like the flavor Bible to that particular item. And then you can use cues kind of like the season or what you and your friends tend to enjoy as other ways to build out that dish. So sorry for the tangent, but I did want to mention that and kind of like the idea of the flavor wheel. Yeah, that's an awesome book. If you could give any piece of advice to someone who's just starting to learn about or experiment with home bartending and entertaining, what would that advice be? Just to, to, to pick a few simple things. And really explore it from there. Like, don't try and do everything all at once. Like, pick, like, one really great cocktail you want to make and, like, one really great dish you want to make. And you can, like, fluff it up with, like, you know, like I said, like a cheese board or if you want the cheese board to be the thing you're really learning. But I think it's really, like, just um, don't overcomplicate it. Like, make sure that you're still having fun, too, um, and that you're still enjoying it. And so if, if that means keeping the menu a little bit simpler like with really great ingredients, because that's really what matters. Like you could serve really great ingredients and, you know, it can be really simple. So I think probably that just um, uh, beautiful ingredients, keep it simple, grow from there. Yeah, very good advice. Another thing that kind of goes hand in hand with that is, you know, because like the point of a party is to try and impress almost or you know try like at least to create an atmosphere where people are like i enjoyed that and would do it again yeah right which is kind of like being impressed uh is this is uh something that uh, dennis sendros who's another home bartender um he he brought up and it's that you know trust that the people who are coming to your party if you're if you're inviting them trust that they're the kind of people who are going to look kindly upon your cocktails and your and your attempts at uh you know a charcuterie board and even if it's maybe not the most perfect attempt that you would see in like an instagram photo real life is an instagram and your friends are gonna like it yeah cool uh so before we sign off here kathleen how can people get in touch with you send you questions this is the time for email social media and website info Awesome. So I am Kathleen at thefancyschmancy.com. The website is thefancyschmancy.com. And we can are... You, can you spell schmancy? <laughs> I can. <laughs> it, it's the fancy and schmancy is S-C-H-M-A-N-C-Y. <laughs> okay. I still have to look when I spell it out loud. <laughs> All right. What are the handles? Uh, at the Fancy Schmancy Co. 
So Beautiful. both uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I would love for anyone to reach out and uh, follow us on Instagram and message us. Anything to look forward to? Perhaps you don't have to drop any definites, but are there any uh, experiments in the work? Um, well, it is. This is we're coming up on Valentine's Day week, so we are experimenting with Valentine's Day gift boxes. And if that goes well, and those include cheese, so it's like basically like a cheese board shipped to your door. So we're playing around with that idea. All right. Well, we will link to that too because this is going to launch tomorrow because I'm behind on my freaking podcasting. <laughs> so. Link to those in the show notes. So if you want some crackers and cheese for your Valentine's Day exploits, whatever those may be, it will almost definitely be enhanced by cheese. So it's true. Link in the show notes. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. Boldly.